Kennedy, a 30-year-old office worker, is my name. As a single parent growing up, I saw my mother's financial struggles, so I put a lot of effort into obtaining scholarships and lightening her load as much as I could. She was also hoping I would attend college. Her desire to attend college was likely a result of her own challenging experiences without a degree. In order to grant her dream, I studied non-stop while others went out having fun, and I was accepted immediately into a prestigious institution. A reputable company hired me shortly after my graduation. My mother and I were ecstatic to receive the job offer. We went to Beverly Hills and indulged in sushi on the day I received my first paycheck. However, we were both so nervous in the classy setting that we were unable to even taste the food. As a diligent student, I worried about gaining acceptance into a prestigious company, but I got by thanks to the kindness of my coworkers. Despite having a solid income, my mother and I were unable to break our conservative ways. She kept living in our tiny apartment and working part-time. Our sole luxury became occasionally dining out to save our delectable cuisine. My mother would often comment, I'm really blessed to have such a wonderful daughter who can treat me to meals like this whenever we went out. I'm grateful. That gave me a sense of pride and validation for all of my hard work. However, my mom's health started to deteriorate four years into my career, possibly as a result of years of struggle. We took her to a spa in hopes of healing her. She continued to alternate between periods of rest and activity, even though she appeared joyful. I couldn't stop worrying. Without her, what would I do? All I could think of was that. I met Ryan at that point. He was a born salesperson, an outsourced sales representative with a sharp tongue, and two years younger. It was embarrassing to say that, at 27, I had never dated. I had always shied away from any possible relationships because of my studies and my fear of being judged for my inexperience at my age. Before I realized it, however, I was 27. Ray merged himself into my life with ease. We were both cat lovers and fatherless. And the thing that kept us connected was watching the same cat videos together and hoping to own one ourselves because neither of us could maintain a pet. He proposed that we visit a cafe after some time. He texted back, saying he had wanted to ask sooner but was afraid of rejection. I was ecstatic and didn't realize at the time that it was probably a line he had previously used but I thought he actually did love me. And then, when our friendship began, a miracle took place. When my mom saw me getting dressed up and going out, her mood started to improve. She would add, I'll take care of the house, smiling. You go and enjoy yourself. It's almost like she's the one heading out on the date. Until I discovered that my happiness made her happy too, just as her happiness was mine. I had always believed that the best way to compensate her was to sacrifice my own happiness. My mother's condition improved, and she spent less time in bed as Ryan and I grew closer. Ryan said, hey, why don't we just get married? After I told him about this chat with my mother. That way, you know, your mom can sleep a little bit easier. Even though we had only been dating for six months, I was infatuated with Ryan. He told me that living with my mother wouldn't be a problem because he and his sister, who were hairstylists and owned a salon, planned to live together in the future. My mother broke down in tears when I presented her to Ryan and held both of his hands, pleading with him to take good care of Kennedy. Holding her hands firmly in return, Ryan said, Ma'am, I'm honored, staring directly into my mother's eyes. I could be less trustworthy because I'm younger, However, I pledged to bring Kennedy joy. I was so happy at the time that I nearly started crying, but now that I think back on it, I see that he was nothing more than a horrible jerk. Later on, I would realize how little I actually knew about the world, or rather, how little experience I had with people of the opposite gender. Ryan moved in with us after making his declaration and brought a slightly bigger bag with him. He suggested that moving into my mother's familiar home would be the best course of action. As we showed Ryan around our cozy apartment, 
my mother went into great detail, explaining how everything worked. Ryan, however, paid little attention and remarked, Oh, don't mind me, I doubt I'll be here much. I assumed he was talking about Sundays, when he was busy with client golf or surfing, as I knew he was frequently out drinking for work. However, the actual situation was distinct. In actuality, he never returned home. When he did come, it was usually to simply take a bath and go to bed. And when he woke up, he would ask me, hey, can you give me some money for food? I asked him directly at first, not understanding why he wouldn't just come eat here. Furthermore, Ryan, what about your portion of the living expenses? My mother and I were living exactly as we had previously, and Ryan had not made any financial contributions to the household. Then, with a perplexed expression on his face, he chuckled about living expenditures. Since I'm barely here, why should I? For a brief moment, I was on the verge of agreeing with him, but I quickly pulled away and posed a challenge. Hold on a second. Are we married? I take it. You want me to return home every day, which implies that we should live together. No, I understand that you're busy and maybe staying at friends' houses, but please let me know when that will be the case. Ryan was incredibly responsible when we were dating. He never violated promises and always informed me if he would be late for a date. However, he stopped reading my texts after we got married and days would pass with no response. Ryan became icy cold and stated, I didn't think you were the kind of woman to say stuff like that, before turning away when I brought this up. His icy face, something I had never seen before, completely chilled me. I apologize, I didn't want to come across as possessive. I know that he softened right away. Come on, we're married after all. Do you not think I'm trustworthy? He cocked his head to ask. I firmly shook my head, saying, no, that's not it. I answered nearly crying, I do trust you. He met my eyes, said, thank you, and then added, so about $600 will do, okay. I gave in and gave him the money because I was afraid he might go. That was, looking back, the start of a nightmare. I couldn't tell my mother that Ryan was merely traveling for work all the time in order to not bother her. I continued this unusual marriage, giving money to Ryan whenever he occasionally returned home while I was by myself thinking. He merely put his name on a divorce document and gave it to me, adding, if you get sick of this, you can leave me at any time, when I finally could take it no more and confronted him. People operate in weird ways. The fact that I had this choice kept me from leaving. Ryan had obviously read my thoughts. My mother saw that there was a problem with me, but she never made an effort to fix it. After six months, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law began visiting us more frequently for an unknown reason. It didn't matter that they were meant to run a beauty salon, they would show up on weekdays or weekends, sometimes even without a tiny present in hand, sit in Ryan's room while he was away, and say, don't mind us, just some tea and snacks will do. They would remain for hours, sometimes even joining us for lunch or dinner. They were largely disparaging other people when I overheard them talking. They were creating a highly uncomfortable environment. My sister-in-law exclaimed, Wow, I can't believe he married such a plain Jane, one day in a voice loud enough for me to hear. She has such boring style sense. And my mother-in-law threw caution to the wind and said, Well, if she were attractive, she'd probably cheat on you, to which they both laughed heartily. They didn't say to whom, but I could tell they were referring to me. She's pretty much a good cash cow, isn't she? were the damning words I heard as I was covering my ears and reeling from the shock. And with just her mother around, my sister-in-law remarked, and my mother-in-law added in a worldly manner, it looks like it would be simple to extract money from her. Plus, we can do everything we want, they chortled once again. I wanted to yell at them to get out of the room, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Ever since that day, I've been depressed. Ryan didn't even read my messages and didn't return home as normal. I was blind to the fact that my mother's health was declining once more during this period. 
One day at work, I received a call informing me that an ambulance had taken my mom to the hospital. Upon arriving, I discovered that she had suffered a serious back injury after falling down our apartment complex's stairs. According to the doctor, she would probably need to use a wheelchair going forward due to her advanced age. They told me mom had been sick for a while, with frequent episodes of vertigo. Dizziness appears to have caused her to fall down the stairs. Kennedy, my mother, never stopped saying, I'm so sorry. I just shook my head and sobbed, saying, I'm really sorry. I was going to overcome this difficult circumstance. Considering that my mother would need extensive rehabilitation during her hospital stay, I made the decision to hunt for a house that could accommodate wheelchairs. Luckily, we lived simply, so we had some respectable savings. When my mother saw advertisements for homes in the newspaper, she would frequently express her desire to reside in one of these homes. I clung to the hope that perhaps purchasing the house of her dreams might lift her spirits. Ryan answered, why not? With a nonchalant tone when I asked him what he thought. I desire a private room. Yes, let's also acquire a cat. And I was unreasonably excited when I saw Ryan's cheerful face for the first time in a long time, so I eagerly began my house hunt. Fortunately, I was able to locate the ideal spec home in our community. The property offered full wheelchair accessibility. I immediately purchased it, believing it to be a perfect fit. I could afford to put down about $360,000. I worked for a highly reputable company, which made securing the mortgage easy. Ryan, of course, made no contribution at all, but that was the standard. He only made one hospital visit to my mother. By the way, my sister-in-law and mother-in-law never came to see her, even though they were regular guests at our house. Having rushed to complete the house deal before my mom's release from the hospital, I flawlessly moved us in. Honestly, juggling work and moving was exhausting, but I forced myself to get through it by picturing my mom and Ryan's joyful expressions. I can't believe I get to live in a house like this. My mom exclaimed like a child as she arrived at the new house in her wheelchair. Her eyes gleamed as she glanced at our model home-like space. It has the feel of a dream. Ryan began returning home more frequently, suggesting that he liked his new room as well. After that, we went to the pet store and came home with two very cute kitties. Ryan and my mother lavished the cats with affection, infusing our home with a vibrant energy. The tragedy happened again, just as I was beginning to hope that all might work out. My mom didn't wake up one morning, two months after we moved in. It seemed unusual, so I went to see how she was doing and discovered her dead cold. She had already had a heart attack when I called for an ambulance. Everything feels so meaningless now with the new house. I was so overcome with hopelessness that I can hardly recall the funeral service. At the funeral, Ryan played the part of the devoted, kind husband, but as soon as we got home, all he would do was collapse onto the couch and utter something like, man, I'm beat, before hurling the urn onto a shelf. Then, as I was sitting there playing with the cat and holding my mother's memorial plaque, he asked me, when's dinner? When I realized this, I at last returned to reality. I had long before come to the conclusion that my marriage was a mistake, but I had been acting as though nothing was wrong in order to call my mother. I also didn't want to own up to my shortcomings, but if he doesn't even offer consolation when I'm in mourning for my mother, can I really call him my husband? The doorbell rang while I was staring astonished at my so-called husband. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law, still in their pajamas, burst in, saying, Why, this place is huge, as I went to answer it. Why did you not inform us of this? You see, my mother-in-law had received our new address from either myself or my mother. I thought Ryan would tell them, but it didn't seem like he was interested or upset. They grinned at one another as they strolled through the mansion, ogling everything with Avaris, and remarked, You have spare rooms, right? This is where we'll reside. You're free to go. They appeared to believe Ryan had purchased the home. 
Rian, on the other hand, seemed to be unaware of anything as he carried on unwinding on the couch with the cat. I was thinking everything was over when my mother-in-law, still giddy, remarked, the apartment we're living in now is so noisy. The landlord visits us daily only to make up for our small rent arrears. I then understood that the reason for their frequent visits was to avoid their landlord. With a smile, my sister-in-law responded, I'll take the upstairs south room. Kennedy always seemed to know where to put things right. They took advantage of my mother's passing to move into my house with impunity. I'll send these individuals packing to hell, of course, I thought. Okay, I'll go. Now, be careful. They practically leaped with pleasure when I answered yes, and they exclaimed to Ryan, Ryan, we can live together again. Really, would you be able to function without us? Maybe too exhausted to care, Ryan chuckled idly and remarked, I'm off to bed, before withdrawing to his room. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law told me, we'll be moving in on Tuesday in two weeks, so make sure you're out by then, and they walked out with a spring in their steps. Next week, I muttered to my mother's image, watch over me mom, as if she were grinning back at me and telling me to give them hell, as I gently placed her memorial plaque, portrait, and ashes on the shelf. I hurried to the courts and filled out the divorce paperwork I had prepared earlier, then got to work planning my retaliation. On Monday, while waiting while seated on a cafe terrace overlooking the new house, my hat pulled down over my eyes. Near the doorplate of the new house was a for sale sign. As I was reading a book in peace under a clear autumn sky, a moving truck rolled up in front of the house, revealing Ryan, my mother-in-law, and sister-in-law. I was aware that Ryan had spent the weekend assisting them with their move. I had politely requested that he hold off on returning until the day of the move. Upon seeing you, I may become emotional, the for sale sign confused them. Ryan, however, casually implied that it might be a practical joke and attempted to unlock the door with his key, which of course did not fit. I had changed the locks. Ryan was rattling the keys wildly. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law observed with worried looks. He fumbled frantically with the key while the movers watched, prepared to move in. What does this for sale sign mean? With a hint of annoyance in their voices, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law insisted. Ryan said, I'll just make a call, and my phone started vibrating at that moment, seemingly unaffected. I disregarded it, and as he was unable to reach me, fear started to show on his face. The movers gave them and Ryan icy looks, and the two women watched on anxiously. At last, he gave a call to the other real estate company mentioned on the sign. I was there, enjoying my coffee. Hi, I'm contacting you regarding a property. It is indeed being sold without my permission. Would you please come over here? Ryan was interrupted mid-sentence on his phone explanation, huh? The owner is selling it already? That is not possible. If I want to buy it, are you willing to sell it? What topic are you discussing? He said, please hold on, and hung up. Then, with expressions resembling angry demons, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law rushed up to Ryan and said, hold on a minute. This is the house you purchased, right? No, even though I didn't purchase it, if you're married, wouldn't it be considered joint property? He back with unexpected confidence, Kennedy can't just sell it without consent, so I stepped in to handle it myself. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law turned to face me, startled, and almost lost their cool. What have you done with this house? They asked. With a cunning tone, I replied. What have I done? I made the sale. I mean, it's my property. Please purchase it if you so choose. Oh, I was naive when I assumed that kind of arrangement was part of living here. You can't just do anything you want, Ryan said, turning pale in the process. I shot back. What are you talking about? You have made no contribution at all. Furthermore, you haven't even helped with living expenses since we got married, let alone discussing shared property. You are really daring. I was shouting at someone in rage. The abrupt pushback from a lady who had previously been submissive to Ryan surprised him. 
I kept pushing Ryan, telling him to return all the money I had given him. I'm prepared to seek legal counsel, and I pushed a business card and an alimony claim in his face. Because I had meticulously calculated the entire amount of money I had given Ryan because I have always kept a home account book. Despite just having been married for a year and a half, the amount of money I had given up was close to $20,000. Ryan said, that was supposed to be for our living expenses, wasn't it? While he was struggling, you can't just say that though. Exactly, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law also spoke up. Even so, what are you saying? Living expenses for a homemaker are a given. I yelled back, shut up claiming that back is terrifying for an exceptional woman. Keep out of other people's affairs, you also possess some nerve. I felt as though something had burst inside of me. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law started to shake and clutch each other, as if my outburst had overpowered them. I could never lose to these women, who were constantly talking avily about other people behind their backs. Ryan began to retreat, giving the impression that he would bolt at any second. When times were hard, he was the kind of man who would take off. There's nothing to gain by running. I firmly said, I'll see to it that this is settled appropriately. My determination seemed to have an effect. Like my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, Ryan also crumbled and appeared to be absolutely lost. With a worried expression, the mover said, where should we move the items? I said, I don't know, though it felt cruel. Question them. I merely gave them a kind smile, wondering where they would move to since they don't even own a house. I'm not sure what happened to them when they were kicked out of their place. They most likely rented a new flat via some of Ryan's connections. Ryan had left his position at a corporation not long after we were married. A nightclub scouted him due to his playboy abilities. He utilized the money I gave him every night like water, and although initially everything went smoothly, by the time I completed our new house, he was barely getting by. Unaware of these things, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law had come to rely on Ryan's purported financial stability because of the new home he had built and moved into as soon as my mother died. The beauty salon business has been doing well lately, you don't need to worry about anything since we can help. In actuality though, my mother-in-law's beauty parlor had long since closed. Due to their overwhelming debt and lack of actual hairdressing expertise, they were unable to maintain employment at any salon they visited. Both of them had intended to rely on each other, but they ultimately fell short. Ryan eventually ran into difficulty with a few dubious characters and vanished. A fitting conclusion for a man who was always late. I can't help but feel that my mother-in-law and sister-in-law haven't exactly had the finest lives because they are also missing. Rayan was unable to provide alimony, but I now accept that as the price of learning a valuable lesson in life. People have said that I seem different since the divorce and that I've somehow reached what you could call my prime time for attracting people. In the past, People may have perceived me as quiet and serious, but today, my calm assurance about myself has grown increasingly appealing. The idea of marriage had long turned me off. However, as I began going out to dinner with men more frequently, I would always justify going home because I had cats, even when the time felt ideal for something more. It's a wonderful way to gauge men because their response in these situations says a lot about their character. Actually, my two cats and I reside in a pet-friendly apartment. I came across a letter sent to me the other day while going through my mother's possessions. It was dated the month prior to her death, around the time I'd moved into my new apartment. The letter was chock full of memories, from my early years to my work experience. She concluded with her standard statement, I've been blessed with a wonderful daughter to live in such a nice home and to lead such a good life. I really appreciate it. I sobbed for a long time while holding that letter for my mother. I've learned that buying that new place was definitely not a waste. I promise to live a positive and sincere life from now on, to hold my mother's words dear, 
and to strive for the satisfaction of others via my actions, just as I experienced them.